Welcome to ICAC Live. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is the show that explores topics in infectious diseases. Today is September 11th, 2013, and we are coming to you from 5,280 feet, also known as the Mile High City, Denver, Colorado. We're at the 53rd ICAC, Interscience Conference on Antimicrobial Agents and chemotherapy. Joining me today is my co-host from This Week in Microbiology. He's also from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Thank you, Vincent. It's great to be here in Denver, though I haven't seen any mountains. No mountains, only clouds. Only clouds. And when I rode in on the train to the terminal at the airport, the mayor of this fair city was telling me they enjoy 300 days of sunshine and I haven't seen it but maybe for yeah. two minutes. Well, we're in, in a convention center anyway, so this is it true. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. But you've been working hard here. You've been doing ASM Live at ICAC. ASM Live. I've, I've had the joy of actually interviewing the, the program committee's top picks. And uh, we've gone, they combed through the program and cherry picked the, the hot papers and so I literally had headline news everything from vitamin D and uh, recurring otitis media in kids all the way to looking at uh, Clostridium difficile infections and uh, how to control those. They've been terrific and in fact we'll put links to those in the show notes for this episode. This will be posted as an episode of, of our podcast this week in microbiology. And before I introduce our special guests today uh, if any of the audience members have questions, you're welcome to come up to the mic here and ask them. You can do that anytime, and hopefully I'll see you or Michael will see you. This is also being live streamed on the internet, so uh, the people watching there can ask questions via Twitter. You can use the hashtag ICAC, that wonderful acronym I-C-A-A-C, -A -A -C, and we'll get your questions uh, read to us that way. So let me introduce our two guests for today who we've picked from the speakers here at this terrific meeting. Uh, to my left, he's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, James Gurn. Welcome to ICAC Live, Jim. Thanks very much. It's good to be here. I've been trying to get you on a podcast for a while, so here you're at this meeting, you couldn't escape, right? I, I couldn't <laughs> escape. No, it's, it's really a great opportunity to sit around and talk about things I like to talk about, so. We will talk about your favorite virus, for Perfect. sure. We have an interesting mix of, of guests today. Uh, our second guest is a professor in the Department of Medicine, University of Minnesota, James Johnson. Welcome to ICAC Live. Thank you, good and afternoon. Th thanks for agreeing to do this. So we have an interesting confluence of things here. We have two MDs who are from neighboring states in the middle of the country, north, middle, right? And uh, what, there was one other commonality. They're both Jameses, that's right. They're both Jameses. <laughs> do, do you want to be called James or Jim? Do you have I, any preference? I usually go by Jim. You go by Jim, I'll James? I'll take James. James, so that we know the difference. And we work on, you guys work on two diametrically opposed parts of the body. You know, Jim works on rhinoviruses, respiratory pathogens, and you work on E. coli. So it'll be an interesting discussion. I went to both of your talks, uh, yours today and, and James's yesterday, so we're ready. Uh, and we want to talk about each of your respective organisms. Now, before we do that, there's one very important matter of business before you can get paid. And that is you need to, you should laugh because they're not getting a penny. Uh, you, I want you guys to tell me how you got here today, not what airline you took, but your training. And we'll start with James. I want to know where you were from and what was your educational training? Well, I uh, was a liberal arts major as an undergrad at McAllister College in St. Paul. I majored in chemistry sort of because that was the closest thing at hand. I was doing pre-med, but I had started out as an English major. I did a Russian minor. I played in the bagpipe band. I sang in the choir. So I, I was doing all kinds of things and then settled down to a fairly narrow track medicine at the University of uh, Minnesota, uh, just up the road from McAllister. And then spent uh, about eight years in Seattle at the University of Washington doing my internal medicine residency and infectious diseases fellowship after medical school. Mm -hmm. 
Um, then I came back and, and assumed a faculty position back at the University of Minnesota, same place I'd come from. And I've sort of been there ever since. For initially, right at the university proper, now I'm at the VA Medical Center just across town. Were you at Seattle at the same time as Stan Falco? Uh, Stan had just left. Oh, you missed him. Uh, when I got there. I did, however, I, I sort of took advantage of, I mean, I benefited from his presence there and all the people he taught because one of my research mentors during my fellowship was Steve Mosley, who had worked in Stan Falco's lab. So it's a multi-generational Oh, yes. Yeah, Stan, Stanley's tentacles are, are wide. Yeah, tremendously wide. You think he'd like you to call them tentacles, Michael? Uh, I'll get a letter, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So you were probably born and raised in Minnesota, I presume? Um, actually not. Uh, I was born in the Belgian Congo, or what was then called that. My parents were missionaries. Mm -hmm. Lived there for three years. Came back to, lived in Arizona for the next ten years. First in northern Arizona on the Navajo Reservation, then five years down in Tucson. Wow. Uh, and then my dad, who had um, trained up to get a doctorate in French, got a faculty position at McAllister College and took the family from the hot southwest up to the Mm -hmm. Cold in the winter, hot in the summer, uh, cool. Midwest, and we saw trees and squirrels for the first time. It was fabulous. Instead of saguaro <laughs> cactuses mm -hmm. and tarantulas. Nice. You guys don't know each other by any chance, do you? Haven't met before. No, Never haven't met. met. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jim, what about you? Uh, well, I, I was born in Wisconsin, grew up in South Florida. I went to University of Florida, majored in chemistry, then University of South Florida Medical School. And then I went up north for training, so I uh, went to uh, Syracuse for my uh, pediatric residency. Wow, big weather change. Huh? Big weather change. <laughs> and then Boston, I was at Tufts University. I, was, uh, I did finish up my pediatric residency mm -hmm. there. And then uh, three years in the Navy. I went through medical school on a Navy scholarship. Uh, so I went to the port of Memphis, Tennessee for, for that time. <laughs> And um, then Johns Hopkins for uh, Allergy Immunology Fellowship, and then I've been at Wisconsin since 1992. So you weren't in Boston when Bernie Fields was there, were you? Uh, I don't think so. I think you're a bit young for that. Yeah. Could be. See, yeah. that's a compliment. I think you're young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of training, I have to point out that my very first graduate student is in the audience, Nicola LaMonica. So that was 1982, I think, 83. And he's now a successful scientist, so that it shows that you can be someone's first student. He's yeah. very brave. He came to an empty lab. It was just me and him. Thanks for coming. Let's start with you, Jim. You work on a virus very close to my heart, the coronavirus, rhinovirus. And today you called this, and by the way, James, I, you probably don't know a lot about rhinos. But if you do, you're welcome to jump in and ask things or no, comment. I'll, I'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot. Yeah. We'll get to you. You called them the most common pathogen on Earth. Why is that? Yeah, well, we know that common colds are very frequent. Uh, what we've learned recently is that there's 160 different types of mm -hmm. rhinoviruses, which cause about half of common colds. And from surveillance studies where you take samples of nasal mucus from adults or kids, uh, whether they're well or sick, we know that these infections happen very often, even when you think you're well, you know, so you can have asymptomatic infections. We know uh, more commonly we think about uh, rhinovirus as being the uh, most frequent cause of the common cold, but probably adults, you know, through a lifetime will get 100 colds, I would say, that are due to rhinoviruses. Mm -hmm. There's some epidemiology to back that up. And so, um, you know, you think about the number of people and that number of infections, and that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of infections. So. Even more than strep mutans, because, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting in on one of these distance ed courses on, on caries and cariology, and we were just told that strep mutans is the number one leading infection on the face of planet Earth. But probably everyone gets that once if they get it, whereas the, these are discrete, you know, Oh, 100. so the law of large numbers is working in your favor. <laughs> there you go, yeah. <laughs> Seven billion people with moving the decimal point two over. Yeah, That's right. I could understand that. Yeah. So, yeah. can you tell us what a common cold is? Def define it before we go on. Well, a, a common cold is really defined clinically, and uh, most people think about a common cold as being a respiratory infection that really stays mm -hmm. in the upper respiratory tract, although we know that sometimes colds go into the chest as well. Your, your grandmother was right when uh, she told you she, you had a chest cold. 
Um, and most often those are caused by viruses. I think we're beginning to realize that bacteria can contribute, mm. but the majority of colds are caused by a, a, a number of different viruses. There's probably nine different families of viruses that, that frequently will cause uh, colds. And um, most of these viruses run their course. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and that all happens within a week or 10 days, and you know, you're on to uh, the next infection. Uh, they tend to be seasonal, uh, less often in the summer, and different viruses in the uh, spring, you know, mm -hmm. winter, and, and fall. Um, and you know, overall, rhinovirus is a big uh, player there, but also coronaviruses and parainfluenza are probably the next most common. So Even the new camel one that we're seeing emerge from camel. Uh, so, well, it is. It's been found in all the camels well, in Saudi Arabia. There's evidence for antibodies. Yeah, they, they, haven't got, they haven't got virus yet out of the camels. Give it, yeah. give which it is time. they think is the new corona, yeah. coronavirus and, and SARS entity. Well, those oh are more goodness. serious, lower tract infections, uh -huh. SARS and MERS, right? Yeah, yeah. So you said there were 160, mm -hmm. you call them genotypes now. Right. When I grew up, they were serotypes, and, yeah. and uh, Roland Rueckert, you're one of your predecessors and uh, one of my first mentors at Wisconsin. Really? Oh yeah. So he was instrumental in defining serotypes using antibodies and neutralization yes. tests. But now we do it differently, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, initially when these viruses were first discovered, it was because someone grew them in tissue culture and then used an antisera to show that um, you know it was a specific virus that was neutralized by one antisera and not another, and so. That's really the definition of a serotype. Uh, now we know that uh, many of these don't grow very well in tissue culture. Some don't grow at all in tissue culture. And so it's really not possible, uh, or not feasible anyway, to, to do that sort of test. So uh, these days, with all of the information on sequence, uh, people can look in the genetic code and uh, have come up with um, rules for what constitutes mm -hmm. uh, a type based on, you know, similarity between the old serotypes. Uh, I, I think reasonable definitions have been... Uh, right, right. Have been, been so you said we get about 100 colds each a year. So in our lifetime, will we go through all the serotypes? Probably most of them. You know, really? Maybe not all of them. Uh, there were some... Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the guys who did this work initially just had you know, tremendous intestinal fortitude, I think, to do what they did. But they actually uh, would do serial cultures, and tissue culture for viruses, as you know, is really arduous. Uh, and then doing the serotyping, you have to have, you know, uh, back 20, 30 years ago, there were still a hundred different ones that you had to use. Uh, and they documented that, um, I think women of childbearing age had had about a third of the known rhinoviruses mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. then. And you, if you extrapolate that forward, you know, you might anticipate getting two-thirds over a lifetime. Even um, in spite of daycare? Because if you talk to any young parent today, they, they get a rhinovirus a week yeah. from their kids in daycare. Yeah. Well, I think if you, uh, if you really want good potent antisir, go to daycare providers or uh, elementary school teachers or pediatricians. That's you true, know, We get sneezed on a lot. So... Uh, uh, I, I remember going from medical school to my pediatrics training and, you know, all the pediatric interns are sick all the time, you know, from, from in the cold weather mm -hmm. months. It's just inescapable because you're, you're up close and personal with the kids. And they don't, ha they don't cover their cough. No. The kids. No. The kids. Hopefully, oh, the yeah. Hopefully the, the residents do, but the kids don't cover right. their cough. So, right. so in your talk today, you mentioned that in any community, there are about 20 different genotypes circulating. Probably right? minimum during the yeah. peak cold seasons, 20 to 30, I would say. And then they, as from season to season, these cycle as new ones are brought in by people who travel, I suppose. And right. So and when you look at one season versus the next, you go from one fall to the next fall or the next spring. And maybe 10% of the, of the types are leftovers from mm -hmm. the previous season, and 90% are, are different ones. And I, I think what that means is that no matter who you are and what your immunity is, you know, there's probably going to be one of those 20 or 30 viruses you probably haven't seen before. Right. And so you know, that's why we're getting colds frequently. So how are these transmitted? You know, we, I, I've seen lots of possibilities in the literature, but let's yeah. hear it from the experts. Some of the most creative research that I've read has been looking at transmission of common colds. And the two, there were two camps on this. So Elliot Dick, who believed that aerosol transmission was the way that things happened. And then Jack Waltney, uh, Elliot Dick was in uh, Wisconsin, again, one of my uh, mentors when I first moved there. And then uh, Jack Waltney at University of Virginia, who was convinced it was hand to mouth. 
or hand to eye and, and, and so forth. Uh, and so Elliot went to um, McMurdo uh, Research Station in Antarctica to study how colds get spread. I mean, <laughs> you talk about a renaissance guy. I mean, he dreamed up this thing because in Antarctica, once you're there, you're there in the wintertime. You're they, trapped. They can't get in and out. Now they can, but it's really difficult. Um, so he would uh, look at who came in, culture them all, see who had what virus, and then see how it spread. Then he took that same model and made a mock Antarctic hut in, at Wisconsin, in one of the mm -hmm. research buildings, where he mimicked the airflow and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the same number of people, and would come in with people who were inoculated and look to see how they spread to other people. And he and Jack had this running, uh, you know, uh, debate about which was the most common way that these colds are spread. I think in the end, they showed that you can spread them in either way. And it's still a question, you know, which way are they spread most readily? And it might depend whether you've got a two-year-old, you know, pawing, <laughs> pawing at your Touching face. Touching everything. Right, yeah. right. Or, you know, a, a 32-year-old in the same office, you know, maybe different modes of, uh, of spread. You mentioned today that babies are reservoirs. They have, yeah. and they're not always sick. And so, right. you know, we're always kissing babies and touching them. So that's right. another. Right, right, yeah. And, and so Elliot defined that uh, you have to have someone who's uh, shedding a lot of virus to be yeah. an efficient spreader. And then you need prolonged contact, unless it's a child. And the children just spread viruses very readily because you want to pick them up and, you know, they're, they're, their hygiene is mm -hmm. less than perfect. But they're adorable. So, then they're adorable, that's right. So, so by aerosol, is it... You know, there are different size droplets. Are there yeah. large droplets or small droplets that Pro are? Probably made mainly large droplets. I mean, they would have more virus in them. They're going to get deposited in the eye or the, or the nose. So they're close, close. If I cough or sneeze, you guys might get infected, but not someone in the back yes. of the room. Yeah. Whereas yeah. with measles, that could actually Yeah, transmit. and people have done some work on airplanes, look at airplane air and, you know, what sort of viruses you can find in filters and whatnot. And it's... You know, I, you can find traces of viruses, but probably with rhinoviruses, it's, it's mm -hmm. more up close and personal. Right. Uh, Elliot found that if you put cohabitating couples and had one with a cold and one without, it was an average of 100 hours of contact before you got spread. So casual contacts, mm. uh, you know, aren't too likely. Now, I, I have a cold now, and I know exactly where it came from because I, I, I had a, um, a trip to Australia, and I sat next to a person who coughed and hacked for 15 hours next to me. There was, you know, I, there was no way I wasn't going to get that cold, so... Uh, you don't look like you're ill at all. Yeah, you have well, a little scratchiness in your throat. A little scratchy. I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, had the, you know, typically with the cold, you get the scratchy throat, mm -hmm. and then you get the rhinitis symptoms, so the runny nose. At first, it's really uh, a thin, runny nose, and then the mucus kind of thickens up, and then you can get a cough and whatnot, and then things start to clear, so I'm a little over the hump, I think. So there are a large number of asymptomatic infections, you yes, said. What yeah. percentage, roughly, do we have any idea? Uh, I think it probably depends on the age group, but somewhere between a third and a half, I would, I would think. So that's probably part of it. probably depends on your own constitution of sure. whether or not yeah. you're going to let yourself be sick. Right, and it, it's probably a component of the spread as well. You're infected but don't know it, and you're spreading it to others. But mm -hmm. this sounds like a really well-adapted pathogen. It really is. Right. Yeah, I think one of the amazing things about respiratory viruses is that they, not only are they perfectly programmed, you know, with 7,200 bases, they really do a great job at uh, disabling the host uh, cell uh, responses, and this is work that you've done, uh, but uh, in replicating their own cells. But they also induce the behaviors that spread colds. Mm -hmm. So they induce mucus production, sneezing, coughing, sure. uh, which is really pretty astounding. I mean, they're just incredibly mm -hmm. successful pathogens. Do we understand why they're seasonal at all? You know, I, I've read a lot of ideas about this, uh, and, and some, you know, some concepts I think are valid. Um, again, thinking about children uh, being vectors for spreading these viruses. Yeah. When yeah. kids go back to school, we see a big spike in uh, rhinovirus infections. So there, no doubt, you know, that has something to do with it. But, um, but there's still a lot that we don't know, uh, you know, about exactly why um, uh, they have that fall and spring predisposition. And we're starting to get some data in the tropics that they don't have a fall and spring predisposition in the tropics. They're different patterns. I'm not clear exactly what they are. We did a study with a group in uh, uh, Trinidad, and they found about uh, a very even distribution of rhinovirus infections mm. during the year. Uh, not a lot of variation. So climate, you know, may have something to do with it. 
Uh, but a lot of things are more stable there yeah, than they sure. are in Wisconsin. What about shorting, shortening the course of symptoms? Are you pro-chicken soup or anti-chicken soup? <laughs> I like chicken soup, so I'm, I'm pro-chicken <laughs> soup. I, I, you know, you, I, I've done a search on the Internet, something like 4 million common cold cure hits, mm -hmm. and some of them are just great. Uh, my favorite is a picture of a guy who believed in uh, heat immersion. So he takes a straw and goes in the bathtub with uh, he gives some temperature that the water has to be in, and sits under there for 20 minutes and breathes through a straw. I just thought that was incredible. You can get enough air through a straw. Huh? I, I suppose. It must be a bigger wow. one. I don't know. But, uh, so the three, uh, the, the genotypes are divided into three species, they're called, yeah. A, B, and C. Yes. Do they all cause the same disease? Uh, it, it looks like uh, the B viruses are attenuated, so mm -hmm. they really don't cause much in the way of disease, mostly asymptomatic infections. And the A's and the C's can cause, you know, colds, but they can also cause uh, lower respiratory mm -hmm. illnesses in some individuals. Uh, the C's might be the most pathogenic, but that's, there's still some debate about that. So C's were originally identified in people with severe lower tract disease. That's correct. Is, is yeah. that still the pattern, or they can also cause upper tract as well? They can, yeah, we also find them in the upper respiratory tract. They're, more commonly, they cause colds than they do uh, lower respiratory. It's just that when you look at the sickest individuals in the hospitals, mm -hmm. you see that C's appear to be overrepresented. And is it the case that as, if you have one C infection, then you're immune to that, but you can get others? Probably right. so. You know, the epidemiology mm -hmm. of C hasn't been studied all that well. Um, we know from our series so far that you can get two or three different Cs, but right. we don't know as much about their serology. Of course, you can't grow them in culture, which is a problem, right? Yeah, it's tough to grow them in culture. Yeah, they're very, you can grow uh, now uh, from primary human airway epithelial cells. You can, you can grow cultures that take a month to two months to really mature, and then you mm -hmm. can grow some C viruses in them, but that's, that's a lot of work. Why so. do you think they won't grow in, say, HeLa cells like a lot of other rhinos? Yeah, we, we're, we're confident now that the HeLa cells and some of the other cells that are used to um, uh, grow culture viruses in laboratories just don't have the right surface protein, so the virus never gets in. If you bypass the surface mm -hmm. proteins, uh, the virus grows really well in just about every cell that will grow other rhinoviruses. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's just a matter of you finding the receptor yes. and putting it in HeLa cells. Then you can do That's an experiment right. in a couple of days like Nicola used to do rather than, than in a month, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you working on that, I presume? Exactly. Yeah. When I come visit you in November in uh, Wisconsin, maybe you'll have it by then. I hope we do. <laughs> <laughs> There's also no. a uh, interesting connection between rhinoviruses and asthma. Mm -hmm. And this is, I've always found this confusing. Yes. So I'm hoping you can totally sort it out for us. All right. <laughs> well, you know, rhinoviruses cause the common cold with most individuals, but if you have chronic respiratory uh, diseases, and mm -hmm. asthma is a good example, COPD as well, uh, these viruses um, contribute to most asthma attacks. So if you look in children, uh, somewhere, it depends on the time of year, but somewhere between half and 90% of asthma attacks mm -hmm. uh, will be due to, will be, will have rhinoviruses as a contributing factor. Now, it's not usually the only factor because we know that people with asthma can get colds and not have an asthma attack. Right. But, um, you know, if, if there are other things that, um, that uh, uh, also upset asthma, if you haven't used your preventing, preventive medicines routinely, mm -hmm. If you're allergic to cats and you've been around a cat, you know, it, it seems like the virus is, is really what pushes you mm -hmm. over the edge. And, uh, and this can happen not only in kids but in adults as well. Yeah, it's, it's mostly, uh, it's, the relationship is closest in children because children right. seem to be more susceptible to rhinovirus infections than adults, probably because of, you know, antibody and you've had a lot of those viruses and you're more mm -hmm. careful about your hygiene and so forth. Uh, but also in adults, about half of exacerbations, maybe more, uh, you know, are, have a viral infection as a contributing factor, most often rhinovirus. Okay. Yep. So it could make someone with asthma worse or trigger yep. an attack. Sure. What, I also understand from the literature that if you are infected at a young age with rhino or other respiratory viruses, yeah. it can predispose you to asthma as well? Yeah, it certainly is an indicator of risk. Mm -hmm. And the big question is, are these viruses causing asthma? Are they doing something to the lung? Are they damaging the lung during a critical period of development so that you, mm -hmm. you know, it makes asthma more likely? Or are they really a factor that's revealing asthma? 
So if you're born with twitchy lungs, uh, if maybe rhinovirus, uh, a rhinovirus infection is the first thing that really irritates the lungs so that you wheeze. Okay. So that's the, that's the debate. And my, my personal opinion is that it's a little bit of both. So if you're more susceptible to rhinovirus infections, if your lungs are a little bit twitchy, yes, you're going to wheeze early on. But that susceptibility, if you think about it, you know, if you've got 100 viruses out there and again and again you're getting lower Constantly respiratory. Constantly inoculated Yeah, yeah. Then, you know, that could really do some damage as the lungs are growing. What is a twitchy lung? Yeah, so what asthma is, is uh, a lung that has uh, reversible airway obstruction. And what this is, is airways that either squeeze shut or mm -hmm. swell shut, you know, when they're irritated. And so uh, the twitchiness is the reversible part. So someone with, you know, there are many other chronic obstructive diseases that don't vary so much. You know, mm -hmm. you've got low lung function you always have. But normally uh, with asthma, uh, you know, that low lung function is variable. There are times when you breathe really well and times when you don't breathe so well. And those times can be very close together. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is one thing I had meant to ask you earlier, but you mentioned damage. What does a rhinovirus infection, be it an A, a B, or a C, do to your tract? I know influenza, for example, will cause massive epithelial destruction. Is that the case with, with rhinoviruses? N no, it's really not. Uh, it seems like rhinovirus causes a more patchy infection. And mm -hmm. that was shown pretty convincingly in the nose uh, by doing biopsies of people, even with really severe colds. The number of cells that are infected are, are fairly mm -hmm. low, you know, maybe a couple of percent of the cells versus, you know, severe influenza or RSV mm -hmm. where the whole airway lights up. So it's really an, a finely adapted pathogen for being chronically being able to re-expose the host, make enough progeny to move on out, expel them, they find another host. And so their life cycle is, is gradual. It's not the scorched earth approach that influenza A or influenza B uses to really multiply and, and move. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair statement. And it also suggests that, you know, it's not just the virus, but it's your body's response to the virus that contributes mm -hmm. to the symptoms that you get. And so that's been an observation that's probably 50 years old now, and, and people are still trying to understand what part of the immune response really uh, contributes to that. Uh, to those symptoms and you know one of the real hindrances has been the lack of a good animal model um, you know in people a lot of the experiments that we do are observational so you measure this that and you look for associations where with animals you can really do um, you know you can look at causality and um, uh, there, there is a mouse model now of mm -hmm. rhinovirus infection and, and <laughs> You know that very well because yes, you sure. helped to, to develop some of the viruses that are used in that. Um, and it, you know, it's, I, I think we're going to learn a lot from that. It's not a perfect model, but... Um, My animal models never are, right? Yeah, that's yeah. Why that's why, <laughs> that's they're, why they're, they're models, right? Models, right? Yeah. People are not ferrets and I yep. so couldn't what, resist that, sorry. What do you think is, you know, looking at the immune system, what do you think plays a more important role in resolving time to you feel better? Is it the innate immune system, things like complement, or is it really chicken the, soup? The true adaptive uh -huh. arm of the immune system, where the T cells have to come in and right. clean everything out and remodel the lung tissue to restore yourself to health. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear the, that it's the innate immune system that really plays a role in who gets a bad cold and who doesn't get such a bad cold. Uh, the replication cycle is very quick, and the course of the illness is very quick. So. Um, you know, peak symptoms when we do studies where we actually give people colds take two to four days to develop and then you're getting better. And that's before you would anticipate the adaptive immune system is going to do very much. So those first interferon uh, responses of the epithelial cells and the mononuclear cells in the airway and, um, you know, maybe the composition of mucus and what the condition of your uh, airway epithelium is, I think those are all really important in governing those first couple of days. Um, so and how well you feel. And how well you feel, so exactly. So clearly, not just for the serious uh, rhinovirus infections, but for the, those where uh, asthma is triggered, we would like to be able to intervene in some way. Absolutely. So yeah. I wonder if you could comment on this. You know, rhinos are quick, quickly resolving infections, yeah. and that makes it difficult to give a, a prescription drug, for example. Oh, so you're asking yeah. the good, 
good value for money question. No, that, whether you can do it, because if the thing is over in three days, by the time you get a prescription, you have to diagnose it, get your script, take it, it's probably too late. So mm -hmm. how do we deal with that? Yeah, it's, it's a real challenge. If you think about influenza as a model, because influenza is also pretty quick, you know, on, on, mm -hmm. the, uh, on the front mm -hmm. end and the neuraminidase inhibitors. So here we have a pretty good antiviral. You know, I mean, if you give them ahead of time, you don't get an infection at all. Uh, but we know that the, you know, the, the neuraminidase inhibitors have some effect on the course of influenza, but not much. You know, they knock a day off the illness. They probably reduce the percentage of people who go on to get more severe disease. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you see kind of the same thing with rhinovirus infections. I, I guess one of the questions that remains to be uh, uh, resolved right now is with people who are susceptible to getting lower respiratory manifestations, mm -hmm. is there a bigger window? So do you get a cold and then it, you know, there's a few days before it spreads down into your chest, or is the process so rapid that um, you, know, it, it, you don't have that big a window? If we had a couple more days from the recognition of the cold, you know, so you could take the medication and keep it from spreading into the chest, you might mm -hmm. anticipate better results. But um, for flu, we have a rapid diagnostic, which is not great, but we yeah. do. Why don't we have that for rhinos? There's it's, nothing you can do. Well, I always thought that if you had a rapid, then companies would make drugs, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg <laughs> thing. I, I think with some of the newer technologies, we'll eventually get a good rapid diagnostic uh -huh. for rhinovirus. I think the, the genetic variability is tough. Uh, you know, the best assays are the molecular assays. Mm -hmm. And uh, with flu, you know, you can use non-molecular assays and get at least a pretty good reading early on with the rapid yeah, flu yeah. test. Until we get to the PCR-based tricorder. Where tricorder. It's not going to be PCR, it's just going to be waving it in front of you. And then it'll say, you have a rhino infection, and here, here's your prescription. Yeah. That, that's what I do. By the way, before we finish up, do um, you still see patients? Yes, yes. A pediatric or? Yeah, uh, children, uh, a few adults, but mostly children with either allergic uh, problems mm -hmm. or immune deficiencies. Okay. And then, you know, one other thing, we, we do see kids with, uh, you know, very limited um, uh, adaptive immune systems who mm. get rhinovirus infections, and the infections really aren't much worse. They just can't get rid of them, you know. So, so it goes back to the life cycle of the virus again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. James, do you still see patients? I do, you yeah, know, quite frequently. In fact, as soon as I get home, I'll go on service and have to mm -hmm. start earning my living seeing infectious disease consultation. Patients. Well, it's, it's one thing they can do and not us, right? That's right. So James, I learned, you may have learned a lot from this discussion. I learned an enormous amount from your talk yesterday about E. coli, which you said was your favorite organism, right? Right. And I'm, I, I want to have our listeners go through some of the things you said because I, I find them just neat. And the first is, you know, we, many of us view E. coli as a gut commensal, but you said there are really three kind of types of of E. coli besides the gut? Could you enumerate those for us? Yeah, well, you know, actually, I think a lot of the lay community, ordinary people, or, you know, if I, anyone asks me, so what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I study E. coli. <laughs> and, and what they think of is the hamburger associated hamburger. diarrhea E. coli. Right. And many people are unaware that we pretty much all have E. coli in mm -hmm. our guts. They hear E. coli, they think, oh, badness, newspaper headline, right. outbreak some big food recall somewhere, people getting sick and dying. Like that's what E. coli does. Well, you know, right. E. coli, everybody, E. coli is everywhere. It's in poop. The poop is full of E. coli, whether it's our poop or dog or cat poop or farm animal poop. It's the main bug in poop. And as long as mm -hmm. it stays in poop, by and large, that's fine. There are a few strains that can cause diarrhea. Right. <laughs> but then you get a lot of liquid poop. Right. But the, it's, it's a normal, healthy poop. Um, and so many people don't know that. But um, the ones that cause diarrhea uh, are, are really relatively uncommon, at least in the industrialized Fortunately world. so. Fortunately so. I well, mean, yeah. you pointed that out in one of your slides yesterday, right? Right. The numbers of you yeah. know, serious illness or death due to, say, E. coli 0157H7, which is the poster child for the mm -hmm. diarrhea, hamburger, bad, bloody E. coli, um, under 100 per year in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and when they happen, they're sensational, and every one of those illnesses is, of course, important, and it's a tragedy. But there are uh, nearly 100 times more 
uh, serious illnesses or death due to E. coli, mm -hmm. but of the kind that cause uh, urinary tract infections. These are extra intestinal, right? Uh, extra meaning outside okay. the intestine. Yeah. So the, the intestinal disease causing E. coli would be the ones that cause diarrhea, that kind, and there are about six other flavors, mm. sorry, of <laughs> diarrhea uh, caused by E. coli. But and they pretty much only cause diarrhea. The only part of the body they can infect is the mm -hmm. l large intestine for the most part. The, the ones that um, cause urinary tract infection typically live in the intestine without causing disease. They're just fine there. Mm -hmm. It's only when they get outside where they don't usually belong, they don't know what they're doing there, the body doesn't know what they're doing there, then you get trouble. It's the walkabout, to take the Australian phrase, is when they leave the happy home of the commensal environment of the large intestine, they go on their walkabout and they up and end up in the urinary tract. I mean, I have an easy time explaining UTIs to medical students and dental students who happen to be women because women talk and, you know, UTIs are much more common in women and they know from their healthcare provider it's typically E. coli that's doing to men, whereas men don't appreciate that until they're much older. Yeah, it, um, women bear the brunt of the burden of disease for E. coli in, in the middle years of life, uh, during the childbearing years, from the onset of sexual activity um, all through the childbearing years up until menopause. And about at that age, that's when men start picking up with their prostate trouble and diabetes-related neuropathy and things that make the urinary tract not function right. So when the urine can't get out normally, that's also a problem. Um, so in, in later years, men and women are sort of neck to neck, if you will, for who's having more urinary infections. And it's more likely if patients have urinary catheters in mm. um, or they're debilitated lying around in a bed and especially if they're having fecal incontinence and there's more opportunity for the bugs to get in. Also, little, ch very young children um, will sometimes have them, especially if they have abnormalities of the urinary tract, and that, that sometimes brings it to attention. A young child with a urinary infection Mm. Look out, there may be a congenital blockage to And in form. fact, in an early TWIM that we did, we had a pediatric emergency room doctor who was talking about E. coli and the fact that he's very much concerned about these toddlers who get the UTIs and they go undiagnosed and then those children will develop pyelonephritis, which then in later years will result in premature hypertension. You know, it, it, this is really a, a challenging area. There's been so much research and so many opinions that have been overthrown by later research and then it's raised again as a possibility. It's sort of circular. Um, it, which comes first, the, the damage to the urinary tract or the presence of the bacteria? Are the bacteria actually causing the damage or is damage happening for some reason and that predisposes to a chicken egg sort, yeah. of, sort of thing? Yeah, so when children have <clears throat> abnormalities that allow urine to go the reverse direction from the bladder back up to the kidney, that's known to be a risk for developing chronic kidney disease, also for developing infections. And then the question is, do the infections make the kidney disease worse? And if you do something to prevent the infection, can you avoid progressive kidney disease? And it used to be there was a lot of enthusiasm for that idea, and we got to find out if the bugs are getting up there. I think the latest is the enthusiasm has backed off a lot because efforts to go after them with antibiotics and frequent urine cultures and so forth have just not been all that productive. Helpful, productive yeah. Are there any other extra intestinal sites that e the E. coli will infect beside the urinary tract? Uh, sure, yeah, it, E. coli can get to almost any part of the body and mm -hmm. is able to cause infections everywhere. Um, the second most common is probably actually in the abdominal cavity but outside the intestine. Mm -hmm. And those can happen either uh, because there's a, a break in the normal integrity of the bowel that keeps all those bugs inside instead mm -hmm. of getting outside. Or sometimes the bugs actually um, get into the circulation from whatever reason and wind up landing in the abdominal cavity, having come through the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Depends on the patient. But there's pneumonia. Um, okay. some, often patient, hospitalized patients who have a ventilator uh, tube in mm -hmm. uh, will develop pneumonia and E. coli is one of the ones that can do that. The patients that have intravenous catheters in for whatever reason sometimes will get bloodstream infection and E. coli is one of the bugs that will sometimes do that. Wounds can become infected and rarely um, muscle tissue, bones, uh, meningitis, what people would call spinal meningitis. Mm -hmm. 
um, happens in newborns, that's one setting, also in older people, um, especially once they start developing their urinary abnormalities and the bugs in the bladder find ways to get mm -hmm. out, uh, or if they have neurosurgery where surgeons are actually cutting into the central nervous system or trauma uh, of some kind that right. where there's penetration, right. bugs that usually stay on the outside get mm -hmm. in, and E. coli is one that can do that. So anywhere in the body, and many of the same strains that will cause urinary infections turn out to be perfectly good at causing infections right. somewhere else. It's not like they just hone in on the urinary tract. I think that's more a matter of, that's the site of opportunity right. for bugs from the gut. The urinary sure. tract is the next obvious place for them to go if they're going to go somewhere. Yeah, I was listening to you yesterday. I couldn't help think that we're not really well designed in that way because that's a, to have the, the anus so close to the genital tract is just wishing for this. And so I can't imagine any other way to do it, though. So. <laughs> it may be the importance of the microbiome, too, Vincent. I mean, you, you may need sure. that constant uh, dynamic of, you know, introducing microbes to different niche, niche areas of the body, sure. and that just so happens to, to be it. One of the fascinating things I found with, with your talk yesterday, Dr. Johnson, is the whole notion of the core genome of E. coli and how, you know, you know, you think about it, E. coli's core genome is only 40% of its total genome. L less, substantially less probably. I, I showed 40, Yeah. but that was only after the first three genomes have been looked at. But the more genomes you get... You, the less it becomes. Yeah, you'll find, oh, here's a strain that doesn't have something this. that we thought was core. So the core just gets smaller. And it's still, you know, from, a, from a, the med tech's perspective, it's still a gram-negative non-spore-forming rod that ferments glucose with the production of acid and gas at 37 degrees, and you know, that's the operational definition of E. coli, and it ferments lactose on top of it. Except when it doesn't, and it produces uh, yeah. you know, endol, except when it doesn't. Yeah, it's, and uh, you know, that, that 40%, and what is most remarkable, and you told, a, you, you told a very tragic tale of twins yesterday in your keynote talk. Sisters and, actually, not twins. Oh, sisters. sisters. Yeah. And you, you told that story, and I'm looking at this, this genome concept of, of just thinking about, they have this core genome and then all these different, for lack of a better term, pathogenicity islands that can convert unique attributes and then just a little bitty change in the two different strains between those two sisters cause a very profound and devastating clinical outcome in one and a chronic outcome in another. Yeah, so the big picture, as we started out saying, there, there conceptually are these three groups of E. coli. Uh, the, the commensals that pretty much don't cause disease, the diarrhea-causing E. coli, and then the extraintestinal E. coli. And they all share the, the core genome, so they're, they're pretty much identical in that respect. How they differ are, are the, ex, the rest of the DNA in their chromosome, which are these accessory traits. Many are on pathogenicity islands. And those traits tend to broadly uh, push them in one direction, like toward being a diarrhea-causing strain, an extraintestinal strain, or just a gut-colonizing strain. But within that, there's tremendous diversity. So there are many different diarrhea-causing strains. They have a lot of different ways to do it, and they have different accessory traits. Okay, and sometimes those are whole uh, genes or packages of genes, the islands that can be swapped in and out. So one, one uh, group of them will have a particular suite of genes and we'll recognize them because they cause a particular kind of diarrhea and they're associated with certain patients and epidemiologic settings and so forth. Others will be different. Similarly for the extraintestinal strains, there are some differences, broadly speaking, between ones that typically cause meningitis, cause bladder infection, cause kidney infection, but there's, there's also a lot of overlap. But even in, when you get down to, as you say, a single clone, I mean, this is a single lineage, yeah. two strains that are almost have identical genomes, except for a few, few small changes. So here we're not talking big blocks of genes no. or anything. These are very subtle changes. And even down to the level, there's been a report of, um, in one patient, a strain, E. coli strain, that changed a single nucleotide that changed an amino acid that shifted the binding properties of a very important adhesin from being more likely to bind to the gut epithelium to being more likely to blind, bind to the bladder epithelium <laughs> and the patient developed a symptomatic infection. The one from the bladder had that single change. The ones that were still in the gut 
lacked that change. So it can be as subtle a change as you know one. one that's that, that's about as small as it can get. And mm -hmm. and then you just have the beauty of they just make more. Once once they attach, they just continue to grow, and they end up resulting in a symptom. Well, so yeah, and I don't know how it is with with the uh, rhinoviruses. With E. coli, it's pretty clear that there's an awful lot of environmental selection and niche adaptation. So let's, let's say there, there's no evolution happened a long time ago, and now we have this array of different E. coli types. Well, in a given person or part of the body or part of the world, there will be an expansion of the types that are adapted to the, those particular conditions. So you see these strains here, you see different strains here. But evolution didn't just happen a long time ago, it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. So wherever there are selective pressures, mutations happen, genes get swapped back and forth, and you create new mm -hmm. genotypes that then will expand. You know, if they find that whatever they have makes them more fit, they can compete better in a particular environment, and they will tend to, you know, rise up and dominate. And we have, we, we cannot divorce ourselves from understanding that E. coli is just not a pathogen of mammals. It, it can actually live out in the environment quite happily. And you, you begin to ask the question about the, I'm going to coin a, a new term that's probably already been coined, the environ of the hospital, the, the, the microbes that live in our hospitals on our surfaces. And, you know, we can recover E. coli from hospital surfaces just fine, especially near sinks. And they could be just a little bit different. And are these the diarrheal E. coli? Are they the um, commensal E. coli? And, and, you know, when you begin to look at it, and so how do we begin to ask the question, where are these bad actors coming from? To answer the simple question, can we control some of these really bad ones that are causing devastating and debilitating disease in the patients that you described to us yesterday, just by throwing some more cleaning products in the environment to sort of reduce their numbers. That's been an area of real interest for my laboratory, actually, is where, what are the reservoirs of the bad bugs? How do they get around? I mean, we like to find out which humans are colonized with them, which of their pets are colonized with them, how are they sharing? That's part of the story. And then the environment is another part. Farm animals is another part. And we actually did a study in, we didn't go to, uh, well, we did do sinks, but we went to public restrooms. In, in our hospital, and also in a bunch of uh, other you know, stores, uh, parks, yeah. all kinds of facilities, and went in with the SWAT team and cultured up all kinds of things. And I, I was actually surprised. We did not find all that much E. coli. I mean, you'd think the toilet, that should be the heart of darkness. Well, it was, actually. The toilet area the toilet is, is but where we found. But surprisingly, most samples, even around the toilet or in the toilet, were negative. It's not like it's just loaded with E. coli. But if you wanted to get E. coli, that would be the place to you know, slather yourself around a lot would be the toilet. However, we could find them on, in one case, the, the door latch for the, you know, the stall door. There, a cold water tap had the E. coli inside the sink, so one could imagine that some splashing water could bring up the E. coli. And a fair proportion of those strains that we found did look like, by g genetic testing, the extraintestinal pathogenic type. That would have been my bet, because those Judging from the data that you presented yesterday, that looks like those guys are really good at holding on. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to do out in the environment. You have to hold on. And, and that was really the intriguing part of your talk yesterday. Well, you know, the, the, the survival in the environment is not something that has been well studied for these extraintestinal E. coli. <clears throat> there certainly are sort of free living, like rogue, wild, feral E. coli that are just out oh, there. Yeah. In fact, my colleague David Gordon in Canberra is famous because he did a study showing that the coliform counts in their local municipal lake, which when they get high enough cause them to shut down the lake because they think it's fecal contamination, it's a health risk. Turns out those are just E. coli that live in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> they have nothing to do with fecal input. And once mm -hmm. that became clear, it's this, it's this unique... You don't close the lake. lake. They don't close the lake anymore. Yeah, so now they at least type the E. coli and figure, is this a bloom of that strain? In which case, who cares? Well, it's all about risk assessment. And, and you have to understand what you're being exposed to. And, you know, you just can't use uh, Chromogger to look for E. coli to say this is E. coli so danger. You, you really have to understand what E. coli, and I think that's what Vincent, Vincent and I talked about your talk after, yesterday, and he found uh, 
how fascinating there were these these three areas. I'm, I'm a, well, so many things I, I need to ask you, but first, so what is the contribution of, of, of material that we consume in the colonization of our intestines with these extra intestinal strains? And you, you have published on that, you talked about it yesterday. Yeah, well, um, there's several answers to that question. Um, definitely, we have a continual input of E. coli into the gut. And in spite of stomach acid, you know, people like to say, well, the stomach barrier presents, prevents gram negatives anyway from getting through. Well, nonsense. Of course they do. That, otherwise, we wouldn't have a fecal oral transmission mm -hmm. of diarrheal pathogens. That clearly happens. Right. Happens with E. coli 0157H7. Like that. Exactly. So if you don't cook your hamburger adequately, you know, look out. So stomach acid is not proof. The be all, the end all. No. And that organism may be a little more resistant to stomach acid than other E. coli, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. they do get through. And there's clearly a turnover of strains in the gut. Um, evidence, direct evidence for a dietary input, I think some of the best is a study by uh, Corpe et al., where they fed volunteers irradiated food mm -hmm. that would have no living organisms, and they saw the level of resistant bacteria in the gut drop E. coli dropped tremendously, and when they went back to a conventional diet, it popped back up again. So it, it looks like we actually populate our guts on an ongoing basis with an input of resistant and presumably also susceptible bugs. However, as you said, the extra intestinal strains, the ones that are, are best adapted for human gut colonization, are probably the ones that once we get them, we tend to carry them. And these other bugs, if they're from alien environments like food animals, where most of them are not that well human adapted, they probably mostly pass through. Transiently, they're there. They might cause an infection. They might hand off a resistance gene or a virulence mm -hmm. gene on the way through. So they're, they, they definitely pose a threat at some level, but they're probably not the ones, that, for the most part, they're gonna, that take up long-term residence. I actually think that humans probably pass around strains from one another, be, between one another more. So those are perfectly well-adapted human strains going from human to human. Um, but now, especially with heavy antimicrobial use in food animal production, if there are settings where large con concentrations of highly resistant bugs are being grown up, especially if they have transmissible genetic elements like beta-lactamases on plasmids, mm. and those are coming in through the food supply, as in the Netherlands, they're on the meat, people mm. eat the meat, and all of a sudden you start seeing a lot of resistance genes in humans, it, it seems pretty clear that that's what's happening, especially when the molecular typing, like we did, shows that a lot of those strains are dead ringers. You can find them on chicken and they show up in people causing bacteremia and they're not otherwise in the human population. So beef and chicken, pork, I yeah. assume, any, what else is, is contributing to this? Any commercially slaughtered animal, I, th I would think. Yeah, pretty much all conventionally raised um, mm -hmm. uh, animals are, are being exposed to antimicrobials to some extent. It, it varies tremendously though depending on the particular producer and the country. Different countries mm, differ sure. hugely, and there's not a lot of transparency about what's going on. That, that, that's a right, problem. Right. Um, industry regards that as, you know, Secret. it's their own proprietary yeah, yeah. information. Why should they share it? There's legislation trying to get more transparency. Industry tends right. to fight that, that you know. So that, that goes on. In Netherlands, for example, I mean, sorry, um, Denmark, there's a whole lot more transparency, both on the human side and on the animal side. All antibiotic use is reported. That's considered sort of a public good. Everyone should know it. And so epidemiologists can compare use with mm. resistance data and try to draw inferences. Here, we don't have that benefit. Right. What about farm fish? Is that a contributor? Um, it, definitely, there's a lot of antibiotics used in aquaculture. Again, not a lot of information about exactly mm. where and when. But when <coughs> studies have been done, they can often find um, a lot of resistant bacteria. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes in the sediment at the bottom of wherever things, where things settle down, there's huge concentrations of antibiotics and resistant bugs. All that goes somewhere. So you mentioned the environment spread in the hospital environment. Well, there's, there's the larger environment. Yeah. Um, all of these bugs, humans are putting out resistant bugs, you know, sewage facilities, if you're in a place that has sewage facilities, which most of the world actually doesn't, you know. Um, and then there's all the animals, farm animals being made, huge manure, uh, lagoons full of resistant bugs being picked up by vermin, insects, wind, transporting, getting into the water supply. We don't begin to understand sort of the, the, the flow of the bacteria and the associated resistance genes 
that result from our sort of industrial level use of antimicrobials and in, in humans and animals. And in farm, in farm country, they, they use natural fertilizers, which are typically manures, mm -hmm. and um, they're supposed to heat them. To, but you know, heating won't necessarily get rid of all the nucleic acid. And so as you spray the manure on your field, especially as the advent of organic farming is becoming more popular, you know, manure is a perfectly good organic fertilizer, and you may be contributing to the spread of antibiotic resistance even on farms that are, quote, organic and antibiotic free. So, to, to, you know, one can become a despair and think, you know, what could one possibly yeah, do? Oh, it's hand. a cesspool and you know, we're doomed. Well, maybe we are. But we can, <laughs> we can slow our demise, maybe, yes. if, we, if we're smart about it. So, um, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the understanding all this diversity of E. coli, how fascinating that is. It is fascinating, and I think there also may be practical applications, implications in terms of diagnostics. So if one were able to do a rapid test and not just, I mean, usually we just have, oh, you think you have a UTI, end of story. Well, if we had a test that could rapidly say, well, we think you have an E. coli UTI, that might be one step forward. But if we could say, we think you have an E. coli UTI, and it looks like it's due to this strain, mm -hmm. and we know that that strain is typically resistant to XYZ or susceptible to XYZ, we could give. You, you could make a quasi-rational empirical therapy decision right at the point of care instead of doing what we are forced to do now. The nuclear weapons. Which is to, yeah, nuclear weapons, unless you think you're in a population where you don't need it, but then a patient's going to come along who in fact did need it, and you have a tragic case like the, the sister story where someone dies because the empirical therapy, the algorithm, the one size fits all, didn't fit this person. Because flying blind, we don't know what we're treating, we'll just give what we think ought to work. And managed care is, is going against IDing organism to type. They're just sort of, you know, doing the 50, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, so we give this drug. And, you know, hopefully Malditoff will get us to being able to identify that, and Malditoff looks to be offering a promise of reducing the cost to, to ID, whether or not it will achieve the same level of specificity as strain typing remains to be seen. Yeah, I think the more we're confronted with uh, unpredictable susceptibility patterns, and, and the more one can predict that with a, a quick test, the more value there will be to doing, and also the closer we get to the no more antibiotics cliff, where every antibiotic dose has to be you know, considered weighed heavily because we know that there's a societal harm to the to use of this it. drug. Yeah. It, in the days when there's an infinite supply of antibiotics and you can sort of predict what the susceptibilities are for a patient with the UTI, then sure, well, why do a culture? Just treat empirically. And that was actually what I learned 20 years ago when I trained. The new idea was let's not do urine cultures on everybody. Mm -hmm. We're wasting a lot of, we want to save healthcare costs. I mean, they actually cared about costs 20 years ago too. There the idea was let's not do diagnostic tests, let's just treat, and that was great for them. But the, the bug scene has changed so much now that it's sort of coming back to, you know, it's all great to treat empirically, but when you have patients failing and needing retreatment or worse yet, getting sick and needing to be in hospital or dying, then, then the cost of doing a diagnostic test now Makes becomes sense. Yeah, very attractive. Mm -hmm. So one thing I found amazing from your talk, another thing, is that this strain or strain type ST131, and I would love our listeners to hear a little bit about what that is and what it's doing. Well, it's a new strain of E. coli. Um, among the, the thousands of E. coli strains, there may be a dozen that have been the, the heavy hitters that account for probably two-thirds of most uh, extra-intestinal infections. Um, that's been true up until about the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And since, since then, this new kid on the block has shown up and has really expanded and taken over uh, worldwide in a, in a most astonishing fashion. I'm, I'm not aware that anything like this has ever been seen before. It seems to represent a new combination of ability to cause disease. Uh, it comes from a part of the E. coli family that historically is where most of the heavy hitter strains have come from mm -hmm. that can cause disease. But it also has a lot of antibiotic resistance, which traditionally that family of E. coli didn't have. In fact, the old notion used to be there seems to be like a mutually exclusive property to, to resistance and disease-causing mm -hmm. ability. You have to take your choice. You can live in one room or the other, but you can't live in both. Mm -hmm. Well, this bug has managed to sort of bring them together. 
It's actually not the most resistant E. coli strain on the planet, nor is, the, is it the most aggressive disease causing, but it's, it's the one that has sort of the, the greatest blend of the two, if you put those two together. And so whether it's from that or because it has a special ability to spread or live in the environment, we don't really understand, but it has taken over like gangbusters. Mm -hmm. So that now in the VA system, for example, um, nearly 80% of our fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli are this strain. And between 25 and 30% of all E. coli isolates are this one strain. And just for perspective, the next closest strain comes in at about 12%. So this guy's mm -hmm. way ahead. Yeah. yeah, He's winning the race. Big time. Mm -hmm. Is, so do we, are we colonized with ST131? Uh, mm -hmm. One of us might be. I would invite you afterwards. We can do a, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no biopsies. We, 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 that's the other take home message from, from your talk yesterday is beware of. He doesn't want to give me a biopsy. He's beware of men bearing just wants a stool biopsy bearing needles. needles. Well, you know, the, the prostate biopsy to look for prostate cancer definitely has a role. I mean, we, we don't want to not do them, but we do want to not do them indiscriminately, liberally, as sort of was done in the past, recognizing that they have the huge potential for harm with infection now. Aside from you know finding something that looks like prostate cancer that leads to treatment that the patient didn't actually need and that whole thing, but just the infection part, because of ST131 mm -hmm. typically being resistant to fluoroquinolones and ciprofloxacin being the classic preventative drug that's taken before the biopsy, it doesn't work. And so we, we set men up for infections. So now the alternatives are um, either do diagnostic testing to figure out what's there and then pick a drug designer mm -hmm. you know, for the individual patient, that's cumbersome and has its costs, or give everybody broader therapy that will cover, and that has a little more cost yeah. for the drug, but the societal cost also, then we're putting selection pressure on. So this bug has us in a box. Yeah. We, well, don't, know, we don't know where it came from, ST131, right? We do not. Uh, lo love to know that. We, we know that it seems to have emerged explosively starting right around in 2000, mm -hmm. although it, its ancestors have been here for, we've traced them back as far as 1967. Right. We know it's been around. But there were some genetic changes that first appeared in around 2000 that were associated with this big explosion. So probably the bug gained fitness resistance, but also something else, like it got infection causing trait. ability or a colonization or transmission or whatever. But we don't know exactly what those traits are, nor do we know where, if you mean like, you know, geographically, did sure. this come from Timbuktu or Paris right, or right, what? Right. No, or Chicago or, I mean, or a human or a food animal or the environment. We don't even know that. We don't know that, although really it had, this has been almost entirely a, a human-based sort of epidemic. Mm -hmm. You can find the bug in animals now and then people get excited because the whole food story. It's probably moved from us to our pets. Well, it probably has. You definitely can find dogs and cats colonized with it, but that's uncommon. And so mm -hmm. spillover from the human population rather than it's Fifi or Fido's fault, I think is more <laughs> plausible. And Chicken Little, you know, sometimes does have this bug. But the fact that it's so hard to find in chickens makes me think it's unlikely that we're being bombarded by, you know, a, the poultry a, a barrage. Industry. Yeah, the poultry industry. The, the, they may be responsible for other resistant E. coli coming in all the time. I think, in fact, they are. But I, ST131, I don't want to blame them for. Well, the, the people who have spent a fair bit of effort learning how to decolonize healthcare workers for MRSA, do you think decolonization? of men in their 50s before their prostate gets too big to obstruct urine flow would be a worthwhile investigation to see if we can actually, if you're colonized with ST131 before you get to the age where your prostate becomes obstructive and you'll end up with the, the train wreck that are UTIs in, in elderly men, could, could that be an opportunity well, I don't know. I suspect not. I mean, the idea of achieving sustained decolonization, or e actually any decolon, I don't think we know how to decolonize for this bug. We have lots of patients now, um, we meaning you know, physicians caring for patients with urinary tract infections. I get a lot of emails and calls from colleagues who are at their wit's end with patients who keep coming back with what do I do? recurrences. What do I do? And we're really struggling with that. But Knowing that uh, this bug can get into people's gut seemingly so readily, I really doubt 
that we could decolonize. You know, a, a one-time thing. Yeah. Even if you could make it go away at one point in time, that they would somehow stay bug-free forever. That seems implausible. Hmm. Could you, for our listeners again, <clears throat> tell the story of the father and daughter who uh, had a sequential UTI? Yeah. Well, this was the um, father and daughter, both both with diabetes. Um, the father developed a urinary infection that went on for some time and got worse, and he finally wound up in hospital fairly sick, and when he had an abdominal CT done, was found to have bilateral uh, intrarenal abscesses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a, that happens. It's a somewhat uncommon complication with, with pyelonephritis, kidney infection. And his urine had a... Um, ST131 strain that, that produced the CTXM15 ESBL, which is characteristic of ST131, or at least that's what brought ST131 to attention. It's actually a small subset of ST131, um, and was fluoroquinolone resistant. And I think he'd been treated with some fluoroquinolones, you know, as is the mm -hmm. so, so much our common story UTI, give a fluoroquinolone. That used to work, it's not reliable anymore. Well, while he was in hospital, his, his adult daughter came to visit him. She'd not seen him for a long time. Um, spent, I don't know how long with him, uh, used the hospital, used the, the, the toilet in his hospital room that he was also using, um, and then left, and sometime after that came down with urinary tract infection symptoms herself, and interestingly went through several uh, unhelpful courses of fluoroquinolone <laughs> therapy before people finally realized, A, it's resistant, and B, she's pretty sick, so she wound up in hospital and had bad kidney infection, in this case with gas production, so emphysematous pyelonephritis, a big bubble, sort mm -hmm. of like a gas abscess that had to be drained with a tube. Fortunately, she didn't require nephrectomy. That, that often is needed for emphysematous pyelo. So the, developing the abscesses, having emphysematous pyelo, that goes along with having a kidney infection and having diabetes. That's the usual context. But what was remarkable about this, they both had quite severe infections, and even you know, most patients with diabetes don't get that, but they had the same strain. So she turned out to have exact genetically you have the causality. same strain. You have causality. And, and we have yeah. an epidemiologic link where there would be the opportunity for uh, her to have acquired the strain while, you know, this one occasion visiting her dad who was the presumed source. So, you know, I, I was always taught that to get um, an E. coli infection, the traditional E. coli infection, you need about 100,000 or so to, to cause frank diarrheal type disease. And then the, the classic O157, um, you need far fewer down in the hundreds to tens of hundreds. And so the question is, is how many of these ST131s, what is the minimum infectious dose? Because again, I think this one case with the father and daughter, granted it's only an N of one, but I think the epidemiological evidence that you present is strong, making the argument that if your loved one is in hospital with ST131, you shouldn't use the in-suite bath to, you should go out to a public restroom to, to avoid the likelihood, especially if you're already predisposed to um, having a bad outcome. It's really hard to know. I, I would hesitate to say, as you say, it is N equals one. Um, the other thing is, we never know with our current state of testing whether a person has an ST131 or not. On the other That's hand, true. if they have a fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli, it's probably two thirds of better likelihood to be that ST131, it is ST131 then. at least in the U.S. and Europe mm -hmm. these days. Um, on the other hand, usually when a person is exposed to ST131, no disease results. I mean, ST131 lives in people's guts just like other expat, mm -hmm. totally fine. So N equals one scary story. Of course, the reason we tell the story is because it's, it's scary. All the other times that ST131 got transmitted never turned into a story, or if it did, it's not very interesting, and we don't tell about it very much. But we've been documenting in households of uh, veterans who have a um, ST131 E. coli isolate, usually urine. Uh, we look at their household members. It turns out the veteran is always colonized intestinally with that strain. And about half the time, one or more household members is also. But they're fine. But then we also looked at what about fluoroquinolone uh, resistant E. coli that aren't ST131, or for that matter, what about fluoroquinolone susceptible E. coli? It's a very similar story. People in households have these same bugs. They swap them. And for the most part, everybody's healthy. You know, it's rare to develop an infection. 
So I don't know how wigged out we should get about the possibility of, of transmission and, and make um, substantial changes at this point in yeah. sort of lifestyle without a better sense of what's the risk and what do you gain from making those changes. But more study in that direction is needed because it would be great to find ways to interrupt the spread you break strength. the cycle of transmission. Exactly. I mean, the, the epidemic happens, I think, because of the spread. So yeah. if we could stop that, brilliant. So James, from your, you had a review article on a, on a rural study you had done in Minnesota, I think, on ST131 prevalence. And at the end you wrote, this emerging and expanding epidemic has the potential to deprive us of most oral treatment options for infections due to this exceedingly common bacteria in the near future. So that still holds for today, I presume. Well, but yeah, here, here, here we are. So we're now you know, increasingly using um, drugs that we used to, we hadn't even heard of, like mm -hmm. phosphomycin. Um, if, if the organism is both fluoroquinolone, well, all three, fluoroquinolone, trimethoprim sulfa, and cephalosporin resistant, then, then we we're, don't have much left for oral options. There's nitrofurantoin. And, and most E. coli remain susceptible, old-fashioned, you know, nitrofurantoin. That's great as long as the person isn't sick and as long as if it's not the prostate. You know, if we think it's in the prostate, nitrofurantoin doesn't get in that well. And then there's phosphomycin. So either a drug that we never learned how to use because it was so old-fashioned or a drug that we never learned how to use because it just never was used in the U.S. So now we're using a lot more nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin, and that's great as long as they last. Mm -hmm. But for a sick patient, neither one has an intravenous form. So then, then we're stepping up to carbapenems. Um, and, uh, Which and, my med microbiologist refers to as wimpy penems. Well, they may be, but then also there's, there's wimpy penemases now that are spreading. Yes. So <laughs> how, how long even the wimpy penems will, will remain yeah. active you know, with KPC uh, and some of the others spreading where they are. Um, so yeah, we are in kind of a tough spot. So not only do we have commonality here in our participants today, but we have two human pathogens that are ubiquitous. Uh, they're, they're present in a thin film on the earth, and they can be benign or, or very serious in people. Yeah. So how's that for getting a, a cool ICAC Live together? Mm -hmm. I want to read a letter <clears throat> from one of our listeners, which I saved for this episode because it's from a fellow named Tim who has a farm called Zweber Farms in Minnesota. And you can find uh, his website. He's a farmer with a website. He sells his stuff at zweberfarms.com. And he listens to us while uh, he's working. And he writes, uh, while driving around a field cutting hay, lost in my science podcast playlist, the episode of TWIM 61 came up. And I had to listen intently as Salmonella typhimurium came up, as this is a common enteric issue in agriculture. When you mentioned the work around Salmonella came up with to outwit lipocalin and the idea that people could in many millennia possibly evolve a second anti-siderophore to combat it, a thought occurred to me. Is modern medicine slowing our rate of evolution by reducing selection pressure for more fit individuals? This is not an argument for withholding... This is a farmer. This <laughs> Hey, are you making judgments? No, no, he was looking at me incredulously. This is not an argument for withholding medical treatments to improve the human race or something silly like that, because obviously everyone has more important skills than the ability to fight off an enteric disease, but was an interesting thought that hadn't really occurred to me before, just wondering what you all thought of this. So what do you think, James, from your fellow state? Yeah, well, you know, it's an interesting point. I think to the extent that we do everything we can to keep everybody healthy and alive, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we are sort of working against natural selection. Yeah. And uh, how, how many kids that otherwise would have died um, uh, and have, you know, genetic abnormalities or chronic health issues make it to the age of sure. reproduction and have progeny that may be predisposed to those diseases that, wouldn't, that would never have happened in earlier years. Right. You know, that happens to some extent. So yes, however, you know, so it may be bad in some sense for the, you know, the gene, eugenics uh, gene pool for the species as a whole. I think it's a wonderful thing for humanity as, you know, we're people, we're, we're not just a gene pool. Right. And so I think it's great to have a culture that places value on the individual human and, and does whatever it can. I love that, we're people, not just a gene pool. Yeah. I'm gonna save that for an episode. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we're, we're, we're humans, and I feel that this is part of evolution, with interfering with it or not, that's part of it, right? Well, I mean, obviously, we interfere with evolution all over the place. Yeah. We wouldn't have uh, dogs and We interfere and cat, with the planet. Pets Look at, at home. climate change. Sure. Of course. Uh, and then to finish up this letter, also, thanks for the TWIP mention of our farm. I'll let you know if there's a TWIP bump, like there is for TWIV. TWIP is one of our, uh, TWIP and TWIV are two of our other podcasts on parasites and viruses. If you decide to do an agriculture-themed podcast like you and Dixon mentioned, I'll be sure to listen to every episode as your opinions on agriculture are always well thought out and enjoyable to hear because it's interesting to see the views of very intelligent people that aren't directly in the field. Have a great day. I need to get back to putting this hay down while the sun is shining. Well, so could I insert, speaking of interfering with evolution, agriculture? I mean, everything that happens in agriculture today is almost involved, you know, uh, especially bread and manipulated crops. The plants that are grown today are not, you know, 2,000 years ago they didn't have these mm -hmm. plants. So sure. inserting genes through molecular biology, that's one thing, but all the, all the crossbreeding and stuff that's gone on, we've been messing around with evolution oh, yeah. for a long time. Just look at dogs. Exactly. Dogs are the best example. On many levels, yeah, we're, we're messing around, but I, I view it again as part of evolution, so it, it doesn't matter. We're not gonna change it either way. Uh, this episode of ICAC Live will be inserted into the, the RSS feed of This Week in Microbiology. You can find that on iTunes and also at microbeworld.org slash twim. And if you like what we do, one of the things you can do to help us is to go over to iTunes and leave a comment or a rating there, and that helps to keep us more visible in that very crowded Apple uh, podcast directory. And we love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twim at twiv dot tv james gurn is at the university of wisconsin madison thanks for joining me today my pleasure it was great james johnson is at the university of minnesota thank you for joining us a lot of fun thank you and michael schmidt is at the medical university of south carolina thank you, but michael. tomorrow it's asm live at ICAC. tomorrow morning tomorrow morning you're doing asm live and tomorrow afternoon we will be doing uh, TWIV, This Week in Virology, also here in Denver. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for th their support of TWIM. And here at this live streamed event, our producer, Chris Kandayan. Thank you, Chris. He can hear us. Ray Ortega on camera two. Thank you, Ray. Warren over there on camera one. And our sound guy, Steve. Thanks very much for helping us. Thanks to the audience and everyone out there listening Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on ICAC Live. I forgot to say, I'm Vincent Racaniello. <laughs> I did this last time, too. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on ICAC Live. Extending the legacy of a classic reference, ECASAL Plus joins the ASM family of periodicals this June. This growing collection of continually published reviews reveals our ever-expanding understanding of the biology of E. coli, Salmonella, and the other Enterobacteriaceae. From cell architecture and growth to pathogenesis of infections to life in communities, Ecosal Plus is the single source of knowledge about these organisms and their use as model microbes. A distinguished editorial board, led by Editor-in-Chief James Caper, ensures that content serves the needs of the research community. Free trials available for institutions. Take a look at ecosalplus.asmblog.org.